Hello everyone, Dr. Nick Vermeer here with another edition of Things I Didn't Learn in Med School. Our goal here at Things I Didn't Learn in Med School is to educate people about things that they can do in their daily lives to help live a more fulfilled and happy life, um, whether that be from wellness or from health side or from spirituality or what, whatever else philosophies that you might follow. Uh, and the other half of the videos will be based on the things that uh, we, I've learned over the years that uh, about the healthcare industry, about certain uh, workings in the industry and how insurances work and um, generalized tips of things we can do as a society to try to make a healthcare space a more beneficial for everybody. Uh, today's episode, um, I want to talk about a continuation of a previous episode of how that recent study was showing that stress does have a strong correlation, a strong link to our metabolic health and how it can be a precursor to different metabolic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, or diabetes. So today I kind of want to talk about some philosophies and mindsets around stress. And then I also want to give some helpful uh, tips to kind of bring us back down when we are in stressful environments. Uh, I wrote my notes out here. Um, usually I have them up on my computer screen so I can read them, but today I uh, was running a little bit behind, so I just figured I'd kind of go a little more based off these notes. The The premise of a lot of my videos is based off around something that I've seen recently and how it can be misleading in a title, but also how certain influencers and certain grifters and snake oil salespeople will come and use this literature to make us feel even worse about ourselves and tell us, hey, what you're doing is wrong and it's killing you. And that's not my goal. My goal is to see what does that data mean and what can we use in our day-to-day -day lives free or very, very cheap without having to pay these uh, so-called experts in the field to try to recalibrate how we can feel. So the biggest thing I want to start out with is that when it comes to stress, there is no on-off switch. We cannot expect us to go from a very stressful situation into a non-stressful situation, just like that. It works more like a gradient. We're in a stressful environment, in a stressful situation. Over time, it can come down, down, down. I think that's one of the most important things that we need to realize, that even though, yes, stress can spike and a stressful environment can spike, usually it's a chronic building up of underlying things over time. So it will it'll grow over time. And what my goal is to try to explain that we, if we can recognize it's growing over time, we can also try to bring it down over time. So that's the biggest thing that um, I want us to kind of, kind of realize. Then the second thing is that we all have a baseline. Uh, and we'll, I'm going to call it homeostasis, even though it's not the technical word for this, uh, the definition. Um, or another word is, is a thermostat. Um, and this works like a thermostat, I should say. We have a baseline setting that our bodies and our mind and our cells are, are kind of used to. And we can build up resilience to certain stimuli, um, certain things that are introduced to our body, uh, certain external forces, and our body can be become uh, adapt to those stimulus, those, um, those inputs. Um, so, you know, if we're under a small amount of chronic stress, chronic stress, chronic stress, you can see how over time, a normal functioning part of our body, uh, we'll say, we'll say a portion of the brain that, uh, analyze, uh, analyzes stress can become very 
very adapted to these stressful situations, but not in a positive way. It can be adapted in a positive way and a negative way. Some people will be like, okay, I can take on the stress. I know I have the capabilities. I have the abilities. Other people are like, I can't, but the stress will keep building up and I can't hang on to this. I can't do the stressful thing. It's too much for me. Um, and I'm not trying to give advice on what one way or the other or mindset and that kind of stuff. I'm just trying to say this is kind of the way that I, I do it and I, the way I see it. Uh, the big thing is, is our system will reset quickly to that baseline of whatever it may be. So say our thermostat in our, our house is set to 60, 68, 67, whatever you have you. Um, six, um, the uh, AC or the heater will kick on so it can adjust to that temperature, right? You know, I'm... The idea is, is it gets that temperature. So maybe you want a little bit warmer. So you bump it up to 69, 70, 71. So it'll adjust and calibrate and get the ambient, the room temperature to that. It's very similar to our bodies. We, we run around with the baseline stress, a baseline happiness. Um, I even argue that we have a baseline weight that our body likes to be at. Uh, that's why it's sometimes hard to break away from that. The idea is, is our body gets used to uh, a little bit more weight on our body. And then that's our new baseline. Then it gets used to a new one. And that's a new baseline. And this is how we gain weight over time. Very rarely do you just wake up one day and have weight gain. Um, similarly with stress, similarly with happiness. I think this is the way I, I philosophize and realize that, you know, this is how I think of the human body working. So, when we are under extreme amounts of stress, we may go chase that away with a alcoholic beverage. We may get, go do some uh, stressful activity, maybe strenuous exercise. Maybe um, you have a not so beneficial thing for your body where you might go abuse medications or drugs or um, getting in fights. Um, and these are our releases of the tension and the stress that we have in our body. We might feel good for a while, but you know, it, it's, it's not a sustainable life thing to, to act out and do those things. It can be very destructive actually to ourselves, to our families, to society, to our friends, etc. So the idea is, is we need to kind of realize that we get stressed. We're going to, be stressed for a while, we're going to do something, but we're going to come back to that a little bit higher level of baseline, closer to that stress threshold each and every time that we kind of do these outlash things. Um, and this is why I don't believe that benzodiazepines or alcohol or some of these other destructive things is your solution for chronic stress. For acute stress, for something like that, I there are great medications for that. I'm not saying that. And some patients need long-term medications. Um, I don't think alcohol should ever be used as a anti-stress um, mechanism. I don't think there's a lot of destructive things. I, uh, I believe in exercise and uh, maybe walks in nature and some stuff we'll get into. But um, I just want to kind of go through this quick passage of what I wrote down and tie all this together before we go into some actual steps of what we can do to decrease our stress. So what I wrote is uh, the system resets quickly. <clears throat> so what feels good and wonderful today will be gone at some point. If we don't get the same results, we cycle back into severe despair, helplessness, worry, and all of this affects our mood. So what I'm trying to say there is we... I'm going to use pain as an example. I go out and I turn my ankle and my ankle is in severe pain. Like 10 out of 10, can't walk. Maybe I broke something, uh, severely sprained ligaments. Um, you, and then I go and I, I use the appropriate mechanisms of taking some pain medication. Um, and that takes my pain away completely. I'm like, and we're going to use opioids because, um, for acute injuries, I don't think they're warranted unless it's something severe that might need it. And I'm not going to get too much of it, but I'm going to use uh, opioids as an example. And this is not to fear monger opioids. I think they're, they have a time and place, but um, 
So I take this opioid and I feel great. I feel 100% better. That 10 out of 10 pain went down to a zero out of 10. Fantastic. But the realistic thing is there's still damage there. There's still damage around the tissue. There's still a broken bone in there. So once that medication wears off, I go and reach for the second pill because I got that, that result last time. This is how conditioning works in, our, in the human psychology. Oh, I got such great results last time. Let me go do the same thing. I go do the same thing. And this time I only get one out of 10. I'm at one out of 10 pain. I'm like, well, that's weird. Last time I was at 10 out of 10 pain was completely gone. Now I'm at one out of 10 pain. Like, so I went from 10 to zero, 10 to one. Well, that's, that doesn't sound right. Now I'm starting to question, oh, the medication must not be working. Oh, the dose isn't right. Like, God, I'm never going to get better. And the more often I do this, so the next time I take it, maybe it's one, the next few times I take, it goes to two, three. Eventually, because I was relying on this external crutch, that 10 out of 10 pain will never, ever go back to zero out of 10 because I didn't learn the mechanisms of how to soothe myself down. Um, and injuries are, are interesting because very rarely do we walk around with zero out of 10 pain. Um, we, we can have pain that doesn't bother us. And that is kind of my lifestyle. Like um, I, I have an ankle that's a little bum. I have a nerve that gets entrapped in my foot. I have some stress knots on my shoulders. Um, but these don't limit me. And I, don't, I, never say, I never complain like, oh, this is bothering me. Like I, I can't do my, the things I want to do. Um, so it's the same way with stress. And the idea of if we keep using these external crutches to bat down, if we can never get back to that area of that baseline of happiness, of satisfaction, we're going to keep cycling into this despair of, I can't get better. It's never going to get better. I can't get better. Um, and this is where you can benefit from using tools that are available for us. Um, and some of the things I'm going to talk about today that we can use to help ourselves. Um, and I know I'm kind of mixing in different areas of happiness and depression and anxiety and pain and stress and whatever, but uh, the overarching mechanism of it all does correlate to all of them. So I, I kind of want our mindsets to start shifting into this idea. So without further ado, I appreciate you uh, listening to through that. Um, here are some ideas of things that we can do to decrease our stress. Um, the Instagram influencers, the grifters, the what have you, are going to try to sell you on healing crystals and Reiki and expensive lab tests and um, adrenal fatigue supplements, and we'll talk about supplements in a little bit, and light therapy. And okay, great. All of these are very, very good tools to have in your toolbox. If you believe in them and that gets you on your wellness journey, then please, I, I encourage you to go try it. I just caution you not to go spend tons and tons of money on things that are completely unproven. Um, they're unproven, but they might have some data behind it. That's a fair assessment of these things. If they make you feel better, if you can afford it, if it's what's going to get you back on the path of getting out of stress, getting out of pain, getting a little bit happier, then please, please, please go do those things. Um, but I want to talk about things. What can we do in our daily lives? So the first thing I want to start with is decreasing our amount of caffeine. Uh, we're highly caffeinated culture, not even just in the United States, but worldwide. Uh, we know that caffeine can increase our anxiety, inc increase our jitters, and get us in a very hyper go, go, go kind of state of mind. Um, I'm not saying you need to eliminate caffeine. I'm saying that you should be mindful of it. Be thoughtful of when you're drinking it. Uh, my suggestion is to always drink caffeine, and this is probably a good suggestion all around, is drinking the caffeine the first half of the day. Um, ideally before 11 o'clock a.m. Um, you know, shift workers, and if you have uh, uh, different sleep schedules, yes, it can, it can vary. But that's the general idea for a person that's waking up, you know, 5, 6, 7 a.m. Um, and going to bed at, we'll say, 10, uh, 9, 10, 11 uh, p.m. Um, drink, drinking caffeine in the first half of your day. Um, this will help decrease the 
amount of caffeine that's in your body throughout the day. And then it'll also help you get to sleep better the next night because we know a good night's sleep is another very, very beneficial thing for stress. Um, our decision-making goes down very, very sharply when we are underslept. Um, there are good studies to, sh to show that. Um, our idea of what's healthy goes down, our ability to work out and get an uh, ex exercise regimen that's beneficial, um, our decision-making on what's healthy to eat, what's not to eat, or what's convenient to eat is like that donut, and what's not convenient is having some eggs and toast and uh, berries and um, you know, these are all things that, that can also, that's, uh, uh, poor sleep can lead to in our decision-making the next day. Um, and I think that's another thing. And like, you can see how this one thing leads into the other thing. It leads into other thing. So the next thing is, as we we're just talking about diet, uh, this is another very important thing. The idea of having a well-balanced, healthy diet is, is paramount. I'm a little sick and tired of individuals, uh, especially these same Instagram people, um, and this is always where it comes down, and Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, it, it's crazy. Every time I'm on there, they say the doctors don't understand health and nutrition. Doctors don't tell us about health and nutrition. I'm sitting here and telling you about health and nutrition. I think it's the most important thing. I don't know very many physicians that don't agree with us on the statement. They're, they might be out there. I, I don't, I'm not saying that. I think it's just easy to demonize the medical society and physicians and healthcare workers and say, oh, you guys don't know anything. It's, su it's such an easy thing to tackle, but it doesn't really go to what we believe in and what we're taught even. Everyone says, oh, we're not taught about nutrition. It's, yes, we are. I mean, every, every lecture that I remember, the first few hours of each system was a discussion on, on nutrition and how it affects these pathways. So uh, anyway, this is a little tangent, uh, not meaning to go take it off, but the healthy diet is so important. Um, so you may need to work with a specific dietitian for your specific needs, but I want to give a general, general healthy diet for people. Um, I want to start saying this here is, you know, I am a medical doctor. I am not your medical doctor. You should work with somebody that wants to work with you and that can work with you that understands your health history. But for the most part, eating more vegetables in your day, more fruits, not necessarily overeat on fruits, even though it's very, very hard to overeat on fruits because you'll become very bloated and very uh, full way sooner than you would with the same size of, uh, if you're doing calorie to calorie comparison to from a cupcake to a watermelon. Um, it's pretty, pretty uh, interesting when you look at those comparisons. Um, eating lean cuts of meat. Um, I'm not a diehard, you have to stay away from red meat, you have to stay away from this and that, but I do suggest that having a variety of different types of meat, mainly fish, um, and and stay limiting red meat, maybe to a couple servings a week. Um, these are really beneficial things and making sure they're lean, healthy cuts of meat and not something that's been overly processed and stored and all this stuff. Um, going more on the diet, uh, you know, I, I'm not an anti-carb person. I used to be, and I've kind of gone away from that after realizing that uh, some more of the data and I think carbs are fine. I don't think you want to rely solely on carbs. They should not be a majority portion of all your meals, but they should be involved at some degree, we'll say less than 20% of your meals at every meal. Um, your meal should mainly be comprised of fruits and vegetables and a, a good amount. So we'll say 50% of your plate with that. And then uh, 30% of protein. Protein doesn't have to necessarily come just from the, the meat, but it can come from other sources. Um, then we'll say about 10% from the carbs. And, you know, you add in healthy fats and you have a pretty full balanced meal. And, you know, 10% of the fats gets you around that 100%. I know these numbers can vary, but it's just a generality of like, this is how you can really optimize your, your diet. 
um, so I want to like go on to, you know, some other things that have been suggested at least that can help reduce stress and systemic stress in the inflammation in our body. And this comes down to eating fermented foods. Um, fermented foods such, I can give you a list here, yogurt, like yogurts, uh, kombucha, kefir, sauerkraut, kimchi. These are all really, um, high in probiotics and l these can help with our inflammation or overall inflammation in our body. And I think it's really important to try to include these and my recommendation, try to get three to five servings a week. Some people say drink it every day or two servings every day. I think that's a little overkill. I think three to five is a is really good sweet spot. But with that being said, you can't just eat, drink, do that and live the rest of your life by eating junk food all the time. So we come back to those fruits and vegetables uh, that I was discussing. A, a weekly goal should be of eating 30 different types of fibers in a week. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of of vegetables and yes it is but it's also not as large as you think because if you have one salad we can talk about the different types of fibers in there right now if you have we'll say uh spinach is one broccoli carrots uh some tomatoes have fiber uh especially in the seeds um cucumbers uh you throw on some chickpeas right there are six different types of of fibers so if you can populate your microbiome of the gut with different types of probiotics and feed them with these fibrous foods, prebiotics, you can have a very healthy and successful diet regimen going on. Um, so these, uh, these diet recommendations are something that we can do and add into our day-to-day -day lives. Um, with that being said, you know, on the other side is just decreasing the amount of processed foods we have. We live in a very go, go, go culture. Sometimes we don't have time to sit down and eat, eat with our family. Sometimes we don't have time to cook. Sometimes, uh, we're just up and out about, but decreasing our amount of, of processed foods, um, decreased sugars, decreased refined, <clears throat> um, carbohydrates, decrease our amounts of processed meats. Uh, all of these are very, very inflammatory to the body, but also inflammatory ourselves and uh, go hand in hand with our stress and our, our very of, of stress levels in our body and inflammation in our body. So just by decreasing this, we can really make a, a lot of damage um, go away. At the same time, you know, decreasing our amount of alcohol and sugary foods, um, especially alcohol. Alcohol is so detrimental to not only our health, but also our bodies. And uh, it increases inflammation. It, it causes cancer. We have all these types of, of data of, you know, why, can't, uh, why alcohol is bad. Um, and again, I'm coming back to this concept of, you know, it's not an all or nothing. I like to, to live a philosophy of 80% of the things you do 80% of the things right 80% of the time. So that's, you know, five, six days a week that you're doing, eating healthy, doing the right thing. So, and then one, maybe one meal, maybe two meals, depending. Maybe you have a really good week and you do 100% and then the next week you fall off. But the idea is do 80% of the things at 80% of capacity. You're going to get, make it a lot further than you would otherwise. And if that's too much for you to start, then take the other way around. Do, start with the 20% of things you can start with today. Um, and do that as much as you can, at least 80% of the time. So, you know, that's, we'll say three, four meals um, during the work week. You know, at least four of those, five of those should be a healthy meal. Um, th these are kind of the ideas that I want you to start, start dating with is, Starting with a small baseline of what's realistic for me now and how can I get there without um, reducing myself of, of all the pleasures in the world of things that you can enjoy and should be able to enjoy. Um, it, it's important to, to have enjoyment in life because it's, it's just such a massive beneficiary where we have these social gatherings um 
and sometimes quite often we do use alcohol it, it is around a social gathering and in discussing with families and celebrating events with family and friends and um weddings and um you know promotions and what have you so this this is a, a thing of social isolation that's really been magnified uh bef- even a little bit before covid but during covid and now beyond of social isolation where we really feel alone um but and we rely on our cell phones for connection and we're not doing those things to, to connect with one another at, at a more personal level um you know the social isolation undoubtedly leads to stress and inflammation in the body and can cause issues so getting a uh, a purpose of of being together with people and enjoying each one another's company and actually putting down the phone um, and talking and connecting and asking the deep questions. Um, there, there's a good book about um, about this. Uh, Vivek Murthy uh, wrote it. I forget what it's called off the top of my head, but it's about, about loneliness and how it's a big uh, epidemic and how it's affecting our day-to-day health lives. Um, the other thing with that more social time is having a purpose in life, having something that's worth fighting for, worth waking up for, worth doing. Um, when you have something like that, life becomes less stressful overall, and that can easily be correlated with less inflammation or stress in the body. Um, and when I say inflammation, the study was talking about how stress um, anxiety, et cetera, can increase the IL-6, which is an inflammatory marker in our body. Um, so I'm not saying an overall sense of a direct correlation. I'm kind of using uh, uh, associative properties to connect stress to these things. <clears throat> um, so having that sense of purpose uh, is, is fantastic. And this is why religion is such an amazing thing or having a community group or masterminds are, are great because you have a collective uh, purpose uh, serving you know, your deity or serving your culture or what have you. Um, and then you also have the social connection uh, built in. So these are like killing two birds with one stone. Uh, and it's a fantastic way to decrease our stress levels in our day-to-day lives. Um, the, the next thing is I want to talk about is decreasing the use of chronic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications or chronic use of steroids. Um, and the reason is, is because these medications will bring down your inflammation for a while. But part of your body needs to experience stress and inflammation for it to start its healing process. It's, it's like a, a teeter-totter where we're weighing one side versus the other, one side versus the other. You want a little bit of inflammation, but you want a little bit of pain relief. But if it goes too much in one direction, then your natural body's ability to do, uh, to fix things that are inflamed has gone down tremendously. And now you're out of pain, great, but you can't fix the problems that were there previously or any new problems that come up. So I always say to limit your amount of these. Only take it as needed. Uh, take it as a few days as possible. Never take it more than my suggestion is five days in a row. Some people say two weeks. I, you know, I, I would say the less the better. Um, and using other techniques to try to modalities, stretching, exercises, um, topical rubs, ice, heat, um, all these other things as a combination. Um, we talked about sleep, um, but I just want to give some tips on sleeping better. Um, you know, having a cool room and whatever cool is for you. Um, I like my room around 67, 68 degrees. Um, and then having warm blankets on top, uh, sleeping in a room without any electronics. I sleep with my phone in my living room. Um, so I, it's not distracted in the middle of the night. I don't feel like I need to go reach and pick it up. Um, not watching TV in the room, not bringing any electronics in the bedroom, uh, sleeping in a dark, dark room, uh, blackout curtains are sometimes a little overkill, but if you can do it, I feel like there are benefits for that. Um, having a nighttime routine, stop drinking anything about an hour before uh, you go to bed, uh, stop eating about an hour and a half to two hours, 
Um, and if you can help it, really, I would say no screens before three hours. I know that's nearly impossible. So if you can get at least 45 minutes to an hour of no screens before you go to bed, then that's fantastic. This is a perfect time to read, catch up with, you know, loved ones that you're, you're living with, um, sitting down and having conversations. Um, another thing that that's linked to, uh, you know, our, our chronic inflammatory states is, is just lack of vitamin D. So it's tough because we don't have, always have the sun out and a lot, and especially here in Ohio, but going out into the sun and getting a good amount of vitamin D or taking a highly, uh, um, highly recommended from a good source, vitamin D supplementation can be very beneficial for some people. Um, there are those blue lights that people can use in the, during this, the, the uh, colder winter months and cloudier months. And maybe that's what you need. Um, just having and maintaining a, a good vitamin D level. There are other supplements that are involved. I'm not going to go too far into those right now or today, uh, maybe in a future podcast. Um, I believe in supplements. I just don't feel like people need to be going wasting hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month on supplements without taking care of some of these basic things first. But uh, if you take care of those basic things, those are the macronutrients, as we'll call them. Um, I caught my colleague Dylan Seeley told this um, those are the macronutrients we take. We just need to substitute with the micronutrients that are involved in these supplements. Another thing that's very beneficial for us is meditation. It's not beneficial for everybody. Meditation is definitely not for everybody. But even just being mindful of the breath and using certain breath techniques, just decreasing our, remember that thermostat of baseline of stress, if we can bring that baseline down, 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 it's going to be harder for you to spike into a stress, at, uh, a stressful state of mind. Um, so this is kind of what medication, meditation and daily meditation does or daily breath work. One easy one that you can do is just sit here and inhale for four seconds through the nose. Pause at the top for four seconds. Exhale through the nose, four seconds. And then pause again for four seconds. Doing this for two, three minutes at a time, a few times a day can significantly lower your stress levels. Um, there's different types of meditation apps out there. Highly recommend uh, Headspace, Calm. Those are two uh, popular ones. Uh, Waking Up by Sam Harris. These are all great ones. Um, you need to find which one works for you and the one that you're going to stick to. If it doesn't work for you, don't force yourself. You're going to stress yourself out more than that. Similarly with stress if or sleep. If you're going to worry about all these simple met metrics to make sure I'm getting enough sleep, whatever you can do to get the highest quality and highest amount of hours of sleep is the most important thing to do. <clears throat> Next, um, there's hands-on therapy of, of different types of massage or chiropractic, um, ultrasound. Um, the, these are all different types of manual therapies that can help alleviate stress and open up parts of our body to allow breathing patterns into those areas, um, releasing the stress from different stress points in our body. Um, but also just that hands-on one-on-one uh, -on -one touch has enough uh, ability to release what we call oxytocin, which is a, the hormone that can help us relax as well, increase our parasympathetic nervous system. Quite often the oxytocin uh, is what's used when mothers are, are um, nurturing and feeding their babies. Uh, it's a feel-good hormone. So th there's usefulness in this massage from a professional um, and or your significant other or what have you. But um, this is why touch <coughs> massage and chiropractic have a good role in the chronic inflammation and stress path pathways. Excuse me. And then finally, um, the last step of all of this and what I want to talk about is enduring a controlled amount of stress, which is within your mindset. What this looks like is the easiest example is, is working out. Um, and we'll use running for example. If you run and you just run and 
okay, I, I've had enough and I'm done. That's fine. You know, that's, that's uh, a, a, as long as you're moving, I'm happy that you're getting some things done. But it's going that extra five minutes, going that extra 10 minutes, that's just slightly outside your comfort zone. It's not enough to kill you, and you know it's not enough to kill you, um, but it's just far enough, not even far enough to hurt you, but it's just far enough to be like, once you're done with that, you know you can endure that next time or the next time or the next time. It's learning to, to put your body and mind through stressful situations and not reacting in a way that this is the end of the world, this is the, a catastrophe, I'm going to end up dying because of this. Um, so running is a great example. Um, sprinting, if you have the capabilities. Um, hiking is another great example. Uh, the benefits of hiking are are something I didn't touch on. Um, just being out in nature, that's a huge part of, of all this nature, sunshine, not with our phones. Hiking trails um, can do a, a great deal for our stress. Especially the more often you do it. Again, that will bring down that baseline from our baseline stress levels down, down, down. It'll be harder to get, to peak up. Um, other examples of working out of swimming long distances, uh, weightlifting. Um, you know, there's the idea of lifting to failure for muscle growth and uh, hypertrophy or, or, or strength training. But sometimes we can similarly uh, lift weights to fatigue without getting so much of that bulkiness if you don't if that's not your goal and this just looks like lifting lighter weights multiple times and i'll give you an example of the chest fly exercise where you're bringing your arms together um i will quite often grab just 15 pound dumbbells and just go as long as i can go until i start feeling that burn that fatigue and when it feels like i literally can't do one more rep i try to squeeze out one two maybe three more reps and doing that again, puts my mindset as I can endure these things. Um, ideas of, of getting in a sauna or a steam room and just pushing back through that 15, 20 minutes of, all right, this is my comfort zone. Can I get another five minutes in? Can I get another few minutes in even two, three minutes? Um, and this is the popularity of saunas and, and steam rooms and even the ice, ice bath things nowadays where people are jumping into cold um, ice baths and using that for their systemic inflammation which the studies are still kind of ambiguous, but the idea is, is you're putting yourself to a stressful situation and you're able to tolerate it. I think that's honestly where the benefits come from. It has nothing to do with the ice water itself. Um, another way to capitalize on something like this is taking really cold showers in the morning. Uh, it doesn't have to be your whole entire shower. It can be, you start with the cold and move it over to warm or vice versa. You start with the warm shower, do everything you need to do, then turn to cold as long as you can tolerate. There's just different ways to, to look at these and endure these uh, stressful things. I think meditation comes back to mind a little, because I think a lot of people is like, I can't handle this. I can't sit down. I can't sit still. Um, but just even forcing yourself to sit still and let your mind wander and be okay with that for an extra 30 seconds, 40 seconds, two minutes, it can go a long way in the lifetime. So um, those are the main things I want to talk about. Uh, the philosophy of what I'm, of, of where I'm at right now in February of 2024. Uh, this can surely change over time and recommend, recommendations will change over time. But uh, I think these are, are really good platforms to start a basis of a healthier lifestyle, more beneficial lifestyle without breaking the bank, without having to, uh, blindly believe everything people say so i hope you guys find this useful please give me a follow and a like um please share this with your friends and family i'll talk to you next time thanks